This short video takes you through how carers of family members supporting a loved one with their mental health and or their physical health may have been impacted on by COVID-19 and different ideas about what you might be able to do to look after your well-being while supporting someone else. This video is brought to you in partnership between Rethink Mental Illness, Dorset Mental Health Forum and Dorset Healthcare as a resource developed by the Recovery Education Centre. The Recovery Education Centre in Dorset in usual times offers courses across the county and people's communities. The courses we offer are co-produced and co-delivered between a peer trainer and, an, and a trainer with technical um, experience. Bringing together expertise by professional training and the expertise of someone who has lived experience enables us to offer a shared learning environment where everybody attending courses is seen as an expert in their own recovery. The videos, podcasts and other resources that we have developed during COVID-19 share different perspectives on the topic areas which we hope will help you to develop confidence in your own. Hello, I'm Joy Ford. I'm a peer specialist for the Dorset Mental Health Forum. Um, I've been a carer for some years and also had mental health problems myself and I work also for the Recovery Education Centre. Hello, I'm Lewis, uh, I work for Rethink, I'm the Head of Services in Community for the South West and I'm the Dorset Carer Service Manager. Well hello, my name's Deborah and I'm the um, Carers Officer for Paul Community Mental Health Team. Okay, so we're going to talk you through the sort of our aims and objectives today. So the main aim is to provide an opportunity for you to reflect about how things have been for you during this very difficult period of COVID-19. Um, so we're going. To, the objectives will be to acknowledge the impact and how it's really normal to feel overwhelmed and I think all of us have been struggling with what's what's been happening and finding acceptance of our new normal. Um, so this is about reflecting on what you can do to help yourself and the person you, you care for, um, and acknowledging that that's really difficult when you feel uncertain about what the future holds. So we will be able to discuss how you can ask for help, what you can expect from services, and at the end, we will provide you with some signposting for further support. Okay, caring for our mental health during these um, difficult times. I mean, I, 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 I have found it very challenging. Um, at the very beginning, I got very overwhelmed with all the news reports. Felt I had to be watching that 5 p.m. bulletin every day. And, and I listened with increasing dread as um, the numbers of people who were becoming ill and how the NHS was becoming overwhelmed and and that people were dying and um, it did at times feel very anxiety provoking and I also became quite anxious about going out um, and I was worried about my family and also worried about how I was going to work through this period and support um, the uh, support carers. Um, I guess you had quite similar um, feelings and experiences Joy? Uh Yes, um, as a carer, it's it's not easy. Um, I care for someone who doesn't actually live with me, um, and it's um, a difficult time. Um, where as before, I used to if my if um, the person I was caring for who lives in Oxfordshire had a problem, I could get on a train and go and see her if I felt it was necessary. Um, but I've had to change things, and we've had to talk a lot more on the phone, um, send texts, um, and it's the boundaries have changed and I've, I've learned that um, I have to let go a little bit and let her do things sometimes when um, it's necessary um, so yes it's had its challenges we're seeing a, a, a big varied kind of response to, to COVID at the moment and people's well-being and carers um, and what they're experiencing at the moment and <clears throat> there's, a, there's a lot of kind of a mixture of how people have now promoted exercise as part of their well-being and incorporated that into their into their lives which they hadn't previously done um 
so th there is some positive aspects that have come out where people have adopted new mentalities but there is also people who are, are faced with a real struggle where things aren't, aren't as enjoyable and they're not able to go and access things that they would normally access during during what we'd consider to be normal times um so there's a definitely a heightened sense of, of people's mental health being severely impacted uh due to covid I thought it would be really helpful if we talked about how we have sometimes felt overwhelmed with what's been going on. And um, when you're feeling really overwhelmed, you can become completely submerged by your thoughts and emotions and all of the problems that we're experiencing um, at this time. And also the problems I think we're going to experience in the future can overwhelm you. And so that you can become so anxious that it's very difficult to do the things that you normally do. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the, the fight, flight and freeze responses that we have to anxiety. Um, when we become anxious, our frontal lobe, spit the front of our head, um, uh, becomes really overwhelmed and we're not able to think through at all. Um, so we lose the capacity to analyze the situation. We just become quite um, quite frightened. I mean, these responses are completely normal and we've had them for a very long time. Um, you know, you need to be able to um, to fight if you're faced with a tiger, as people were, or you needed to take flight and run away from it. Or it's possible that you might freeze and your body is trying to prepare for what it's going to do next. But we know that if we experience anxiety and we experience these three things on a regular basis, then that's really, really bad for our physical and mental health. And a little bit further on, we will talk about different responses to anxiety and the different effects that it has. And we'll give you um, hints and tips as to how to cope with it. Um, and it's not always easy. Um, sometimes I long just for a moment of complete solitude and to be time to myself. Um, also, there are times when I feel lonely because I miss the people that I interact with outside of the home. Um, and there are days when I felt I haven't been able to carry on, especially if the person I care for is in a sort of negative mood because that can rub off on me. And we all have mental health problems. Um, it's a continuum and it's not even fixed or static. There's no right or wrong way, it's just our way. And that's all right, and it's understandable to feel anxious, as I have, and fearful sometimes. We're in an abnormal situation, so we can't expect to feel normal all the time. And um, that's how I've been sort of coping, thinking, well, I'm not the only one. There are others out there feeling the same. And I guess that's been one sort of really positive thing, isn't it, that we are all feeling this, everyone in society. So I think that's that's helped as well, that, that you just know that you're feeling the same um, as others are. I mean, how about you, Lewis? I know that you're dealing with a lot of um, a lot of the carers are contacting you. What sort of things are you picking up from them? So I, I think it's again it's the the kind of impact on, on people and, and and everybody's going through very different individual situations that's unique to themselves. Um, so I think the word overwhelmed means it means a lot as far as carers are concerned because that that's something we see um, almost every carer at the moment is feeling or that we're we're sort of working with is explaining and stating that they are feeling very overwhelmed they're very stressed there's no break um there's no outlet for them at the moment um and this is where you know having that support from from our service helps that person to kind of make better choices and, and to be able to um go out without feeling that guilt and just take a bit of ownership with with what they can and and I guess part of it is being able to to change the things they can change, but let go of the things that they can't control. And that that's something that we regularly have conversations with carers around at the moment is, is that kind of not being in control of certain things, but changing the things you are in control of. And that that's a kind of message we want to echo through to people that we hope will help with their well-being. I think my world feels as if it's shrunk during lockdown. Um, and as much as I love my home and my garden, I'm finding myself confined to a smaller world to live in. And that's actually been having a compact on my own mental health, as well as the people I live with. Um, there's no spontaneity in my life anymore. I can't actually wake up in the morning and think, 
I don't mind going to the cinema today because it's not open. You can't do it. I can't even think to I'll meet a friend and go for a coffee. Um, and many of the little things that I've taken for granted have been put on hold. And it feels hard sometimes to stay positive. Caring for someone is a difficult task, task whenever things when everything's normal. But with the social distancing, it's added to the situation. Um, my own mental health is just as important as the person we care for. And I try not to also become caught up with the pros and cons about COVID in social media. That can really add to things. And you don't know what's fake and what's true. So mm -hmm. I try to stick to the NHS updates and the general news on TV or radio. And when I need to know more, I go to the government updates updates that are on the television around the five o'clock time and I just keep it at that so that I don't get caught up with things. I know that um, Carers UK have done some really good research and it would be you know it'd be helpful to go to their website to look at it but one of the things that they've um, highlighted is that carers are caring much more um, they're doing many hours more as services have been reduced or have stopped altogether um, so they've identified that and also people who um, carers who worked and actually got some respite from their caring role they are now if they're either working at home or furloughed and they're finding that very difficult that it's very difficult to get some space um, away from the person that they that they care for so um, I think it's it's having a big impact isn't it I know some of the carers that I've spoken to I know several have said how difficult it is to have to talk to someone you love for an open window and um, not be able to go to a cafe or go for a walk or do all the things that you used to do together and then some other carers that I've spoke to have said it's actually helped them to set some boundaries and that you know instead of um seeing seeing say their mother every day they've been able to say well you know i i can't i can't do that i'll i'll get shopping and i'll see you maybe twice a week and though it was quite anxiety provoking at first for the carer and the cared for actually i think it's had some positive benefits because the person knows that actually they will be fine and they will see their son or daughter um, a couple of days in the week and the, the carer has actually had some time to themselves um, to cope with the things that they need to do and to, to care for their family so I know that one carer in particular said to me that they hope that they're going to be strong enough to actually keep up those boundaries because it's been beneficial for both of them. Um, so the stress bucket is something I feel uh, is is really important. I, I feel it's a good visual aid to to kind of get people to recognise when when things are getting too much and when they need to relieve some of that pressure for themselves. And it, it's also a good indication of what can happen when we put too much pressure and too much stress on ourselves. Um, no matter who you are or how strong you are, that everybody has a, um, a point where they can no longer cope or no longer manage the situation. Um, because things are getting too much and what we really want to promote and aid is, is people to allow that respite and, and allow themselves a step back from that caring role um, by doing small things and being mindful of, of what they can do to decrease that stress and to help themselves manage better in, in their current situation uh, and the, st the stress bucket is just a really good tool to be able to do that and, and recognize uh, when things are getting too much and, and this is a time to, to reflect on that to see what it might look like and what what the factors are that might f fill the bucket up and and what factors you might put in to to prevent that from happening yeah, i think it's as um lewis says the st stress bucket varies in size for all of us and our own vul vulnerability towards stress some of us can cope cope with several things happening at once and have the ability to manage it and others are far less before they start to trouble um, struggle and it doesn't mean you're good or bad it just means that's the person you are and you might feel reluctant to ask for help when you feel this stressed but it's really important to speak to someone about how you're feeling and um, be able to offload and talk about your feelings to safeguard your own well-being working out ways to ease the stress and trying to prevent it is better than waiting until it gets too much to handle and you become ill yourself it might also help sometimes to find out what stresses the person that you care for, what things trigger their stress so that you can work together 
to help each other um, with, with the stress that may be around. What do you feel? I think, I think um, yeah, it, I think it's really, really important to talk to people. And I think it's really important, you know, all the basic things like getting enough sleep and taking exercise, all the things that you can do um, to help with your stress levels. And I think sometimes the carers that I've worked with often tend to put themselves last. You know, they feel that they must must do everything for the person that they love and leave very little time for themselves. But, you know, research shows us that that you must you must look after yourself and you must take care of your own physical and mental health first so that you can be strong enough to deal with any ongoing issues that you have within your caring role. Yeah, and I think I think that's a really valid point as well because carers often talk about the fear of what would it look like if they weren't able to provide that caring role, and without kind of having the basic values of of the stress bucket, is actually if you, you don't manage your stress and you don't manage your situation, then inevitably what will happen is you will no longer be able to provide that level of care that you need to provide. Um, so the importance of looking after your own well-being is massive in all of this because it creates that ability to be able to continue to care in the right way but also allows that that step back for yourself as a carer to allow that respite and and carers you know we strongly promote carers to take that respite because it's not always easy and it's not always the first thing that comes mm -hmm. uh, to, to people's minds when they when they are trying to manage their own stress levels they're often trying to manage the stress and and uh, uh, mental health of their cared for person I think looking at this and self-managing um, and when someone's unwell um, perhaps with mental illness it's um, make framing that mental illness as part of them and not them um, it becomes one of life's challenges instead of being that person with a mental illness I mean I suffer from depression and I don't want to be known as oh that's the woman with depression as if that's all I am a person with depression I want to be known as me the person that uh, does all sorts of different things who sometimes suffers from depression and um, I have I handle it that way and challenge it as something that's part of me but not the whole of me um, and for carers um it's justifiably you feel a burden of the role you're doing but the person's recovery requires the cared for person especially with mental illness to become more responsible for their own well-being so you're encouraging them to do things um and that means nurturing their ability and facilitating opportunities for them to take control and make changes in their own lives um it's it's not seeing them with a mental illness it's seeing them as getting better and managing their life in spite of them illness mm. well, that's the way i feel that um acceptance and self-managing is i don't know how you feel lewis uh, yeah I, th I think it's it's really important and and, and um empowering for for somebody who is, is able to kind of self-manage their situation and, and take control of what's happening in their lives um and, and kind of knowing that things might not be uh, the, the normal that they were once familiar with but the direction is kind of going in the right place in, in terms of recovery and, and, and as an outcome that it's all moving to a pathway that's going to create a, a unique bespoke outcome for somebody for the better, which I think is really important. Mm. And, and I think in its wider sense, acceptance with what's happening now at the moment um, in the world, I think it's a way that we've all gradually come to accept uh, our new normal and what's happening. And I think that does really help with anxiety when you just think, OK, I'll do what I can do, um, but but I have to accept this because this is this is the situation the world's in now. We decided to call re um, recovery and to think of it as discovery because doing the um, recovery education courses, um, uh, certainly with carers, the word recovery, they saw it as a person getting really better and back to their old selves. And that's with any illness and with any life experience, whether it's divorce, bereavement or whatever, you're never, ever exactly the same as you were before that happens. And um, it's it's not like having a bout of flu and getting over it. Um, you, you change. 
And um, with um, any sort of illness, I think you have to think about discovery, discovery being a better word for people to understand. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes you have good days and you have bad, bad days. Recovery or discovery, it's not about the cause or how to stop a mental health problem. It's about an absence of symptoms. It is a highly personal process involving an ebb and flow, but in general direction of progress. It requires the person you support to take responsibility for themselves and to be active in their progress, giving them confidence in their own potential as a human being. For people to grow and acquire a new sense of purpose in spite of their health problems, be it physical or mental. As carers, we are there first to support this journey as we travel on our road of discovery. It is about the growth and explanation and finding a way to use personal strength and knowing when to ask for help. And I think that's the main thing when you start to feel wobbly or you've taken a few steps back to ask for help that, and that you need a little bit of support at that time. Okay, so I'm going to talk now a little bit about valued social roles. Um, you know, we all like to feel that we've got some control and we can make decisions about how we live our lives and, you know, where we work and how we work. But I think everything has been turned on its head recently um, and we've had to let go of some of those roles. I think particularly for people who um, are no longer working or have lost um, valued um, employment or um, people who've been furloughed and, you know, carers who are having to readjust uh, their lives. Um, I think it's been a very challenging time. And I think carers have been incredibly resourceful, um, I think, as they're very used to juggling lots of different roles. So I think that a lot of them have been able to, you know, sort of reset the clock in a way and think, OK, these are the things that I need to do and I think sometimes the almost the lockdown has helped people as in the care I spoke to before where you know they've had to set boundaries um, they couldn't do the things that they always did for the person that they cared for um, and in some cases that has meant that the cared for person has actually taken dipped a toe in the water almost to to actually attend to their own needs more so um, I think that's been really really helpful but it does mean that as we go forward it is about carers sort of nurturing that ability and continuing to make opportunities so that they can manage their their lives and make the changes that they need to going forward um i don't know how you feel about that joy um i think everyone needs to feel valued um and it makes some meaning into the, their lives um and whether you're the carer or the person needing support, a valued social role provides scaffolding for an emergence, emerging identity of anybody. Um, and it can involve social roles which have nothing to do with mental health or the physical health they have, whatever. Um, but, but this doesn't mean us as carers to do everything on our own. But carers sometimes feel obliged to take that control because there's no other option that seems open to them. But there is a role for carers in the recovery journey of an individual, which can lead to the journey of a recovery of the life of their own. Um, mm. But it's it's um, letting the control go. And what about you, um, Lewis? What do you think? Well, I, I just believe the importance of it around well-being. We know there's lots of factors to poor decline in mental health, and and that can be. Uh, your social environment it can be employment like like Deborah was was explaining earlier on <clears throat> and and this is just one of the key elements that if if we lose focus of not having our 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 value within society then we, that will have a negative impact on uh, impact on our mental health and and it's our responsibility to ensure that 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 doesn't happen as, as and I don't mean ours in in a service but ours as an individual to make sure that we are mindful and, and looking at what we're doing to kind of make sure that we have that that role within society and, and uh, so the, the next slide is is belief acceptance and, and hope and, and this is kind of stuff that you know we, we feel needs to be installed in, in people and adopted uh, in, into people's mentality around what what the future holds and what that provision looks like um, and they're, they're free core things that we can do in, in terms of moving forward and, and looking after our, our well-being and having that mindset. Relationships can be intimate and complex and sometimes delicate things and they um, develop over time 
and often need attending to just to keep the balance. I mean, if you've been together for a few years, you know yourself how things change and um, you, you live differently. And, and a serious, sometimes long term illness can also upset the balance of a relationship. And when one of you needs to be cared for in a more significant way by the other, it's an important shift and the balance tilts in one direction. And this can cause resentment, sometimes stress and guilt. And the act of showing love often slips because caring changes the dynamics of the relationship. At a time like this during um, COVID, it's understandable that we may have moments of anxiety and may, may feel even that we can't go on. And we can remind ourselves of our relationship we share when we feel so stressed. But remember, it's understandable and normal. No one can fully appreciate what caring is like for you. It's we're all different. And I found sometimes I just have to walk away and go into another room. For me, the bathroom, because I can lock the door and just sit quietly for a few controlled breaths until I feel calmer. And that helps me cope when I feel I need it and I before I go on and carry on. I mean, I think a lot of the carers that I have spoken to um, often feel that they, no matter what I say to the contrary, they feel that they just don't do enough. They feel that if they just did a bit more, if they were just more empathetic, if they were just more firmer, if they just got more organised, you know, they would be able to help more. And I think that's a really difficult position for someone to be in, because I think because things Aren't, don't change quickly sometimes I think carers can often feel um, quite guilty you know feel it making themselves responsible um, for somebody else and that's something I often do a lot of working through with carers in that you know you can only do so much mm. you can only do so much and um, I think it's really helpful if carers are feeling like that, that they perhaps um, access one of the talking treatments through Steps to Wellbeing or um, the carers counselling, because I think it's really helpful to to explore those very difficult um, feelings. So, so there's kind of some scenarios which are, are really interesting and it's kind of people we have a perception where every carer must love the cared for person and, and must um, enjoy that caring role because it's something that they're doing free will and, and mm. actually that that's not the case sometimes the cared for person like like many relationships over time some relationships take certain pathways in certain directions and what's hard for a carer is when they no longer feel the same way or, or the relationship has been kind of compromised over time but they they feel that they can't say that the relationship is going in a negative way and they continue that caring role and that is the only thing that is bonding that relationship together is that that caring responsibility for that person mm -hmm. and, and what I kind of really what what's really nice sometimes is where you can see the frustration in a carer but they are too scared to say how they really feel and mm -hmm. one of the, the the kind of nicest people it, it, the nicest things that I, I see within my work is is getting to to help people access groups where they finally are allowed to kind of share that expression because somebody in that group mm -hmm. will be sharing mm -hmm. a very similar experience and it allows people to go I'm not the only one I'm not the only person in this situation and and almost creates a really nice vibe where everybody lets off a lot of steam and everybody says you know, appropriate things that they might not have been able to say or might have been kind of containing for a long period of time and to uh, and to watch it all spill out into this group and everyone support each other it is a really good moment and I think it's a good time to reflect that everybody not everybody is in a position where that relationship is great and, it, and it's okay to be frustrated with your cared for person it's okay for that relationship but it's also understanding what support might be out, out of there to help you move on from that relationship or that caring responsibility wrong. I mean I know as well when like, sometimes when I'm talking with carers they feel that their, that relationship as being a husband or a wife has actually that's gone now and they do just feel that they are the carer because it isn't reciprocal you know the, the if the person may be so unwell that they're they're just not aware of another person's needs and I think that's very very challenging but the other side of it is often when I ask people about the relationship um, often carers will say it's better you know our relationship is better it's stronger for what we've been through together so it's it's very it's unique, isn't it, to each um, each yeah. individual relationship? 
I suppose in the scheme of a family life with caring responsibilities, other obligations, maybe even work at times and keeping up with life and the, the simple act of love can just kind of slip away. And such gestures are vital to a relationship to keep it going. And making a simple gesture such as sharing a cup of tea reminds each other of the bond you share and gives each other comfort. And sharing a programme you both enjoy on TV or going for a favourite walk together. It's just the little things, but they can remind us of the bonds we share. And encouraging the person you to support to try and do things for themselves helps them feel good as well as you. But you may not do it. They may not do it to your standard, but they are trying and will feel valued and continue to try if you see that it makes you feel happy. But it's also remembering to find time for yourself. And if you're feeling stressed and unable to cope, you won't be able to support someone unless you do take time for yourself. So asking for help and talking about it isn't a weakness, it's a strength. And what I did when um, I was going through a really difficult time was we got a, had a little concrete area in our garden, which was just around the corner. And I put a seat there and I put lots and lots of plants. And it was um, it was named by my children as Mum's Secret Garden. And I used to go in there and just sit and nobody could actually see me unless they actually turned around the corner and looked for me. But that gave me my little space. But even if it was five or ten minutes, it helped me recharge my batteries and helped me feel better. Um, I don't know. What, how do you feel about this, um, Lewis? Yeah, I, I, it's something we heavily promote within the service and, and it's something that we our first portal call is helping a carer to recognize when they need some time out and and how how that looks within within the family home or the dynamics that might present um and and nine times out of ten we we, we will find a solution for somebody to to get that respite and in in some of the worst scenarios there there is opportunity for respite uh, and i guess that that's part of that hope and belief that although the moment might be you know very traumatic and, and and very hard to deal with is that there is hope that there is respite at the at the kind of at short intervals it might be or kind of here and there but it's taking advantage of that moment of when that respite is there and, and using it to to breathe and, and reflect and, and allow that process to continue and i think sometimes it's about reassurance isn't it about reassuring the the person that does the caring that the person that they care for will be okay you know even even just for half an hour or so but i think people worry but i think the more that they build their confidence up and see that someone is fine while well, they you know that they've gone out for a walk and they've come back and everything is fine i think that's really good for both for both parties and it is sometimes isn't it about just you know just 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 finding a way just finding a way to get some time um to yourself to quietly sit and read or listen to music or um listen to one of the podcasts or all the fabulous things that are available uh, online and just encouraging carers as you said to to take that time for themselves and how important it is so re reflection is really really important and it's something we all do uh, it's in our nature to reflect on on what went well, what didn't go well, um, and it's one of the dynamics that we lose sometimes as as carers around what our role is because we don't have that moment or that opportunity as as others may do to reflect. Um, but I think it's capturing those moments, as as Joy was saying in the last slide, around making time for yourself is a great time to kind of sometimes use that reflection tool to look at what we're we doing to to aid independence or, or making things better what are we doing to to kind of move forward and i think now is a really important time to reflect where services are limited where support isn't available at its full capacity what we're used to seeing it means inevitably that the carer has more of a role and a more of a, of a duty within that role where the, those healthcare professionals are no longer there to, to promote that independent recovery and and to, to promote employment or whatever it is that that may be that person's goal. Um, and as a reflection tool, it, it can be good to say, well, what, what goals are being set and how can we continue the process of moving forward in this time rather than stopping and, and kind of waiting is how can we continue to move forward? And it's again that that time to see what are we doing as a carer? Are we doing everything? And if we are doing everything as a carer, is that good for the cared for person or actually are we holding that person back? Um, 
and, and there's lots of different variations of, of, of carers and the level of support that they provide. But I, I think it's a good question is to always ask, what can I do? And, and sometimes what can I do that? that could be less than what I'm doing at the moment that will aid that person to move forward um, and that could be in terms of employment university leaving the family home and, and sometimes for a carer that can be really scary when when they've been in that role for a long time it can be a very scary kind of thought that the cared for person is moving forward but a great time to reflect on on actually what can I do to promote and aid that because it is the right decision essentially for that person and it's about finding balance isn't it and I guess one of the things that this this time in our lives has actually allowed us to think about that sometimes I think for the first time because people have been so busy juggling all their different roles that now you know they've had an opportunity hopefully to have some time to sit and think about life and how it will be going forward um, you know so many people have said haven't they that they've noticed the spring you know for the first time and all the different colors and all the different sounds which they just hadn't you know really noticed before because they were so busy with their other roles so you know that's a really positive thing as well and i think people will hopefully take this opportunity to change and get a better work life balance um moving forward yeah i think it is i think for carers it's it's learning when it's time to actually start to let go um, and start to pick up your own life um, but at the same time you worry have they taken their medication so instead of um, you might even say and it annoys the person because you say have you taken your medication this morning um, and I can remember doing that with my son and him getting quite irritated and also um, as a carer you've got to think about your own physical health and your mental health because they're closely interwoven and it's important to look after our own health. It's not selfish to put yourself first, but as a carer, it can make you feel that way. And if you don't actually look after yourself, you're not in the position to look after anybody else because you're not well enough. Um, so I think to, uh, for me, for a carer to finalise is to say, um, do something each day that helps you relax, even if it's a five minute break. Um, and sit down to eat. I can remember, sometimes eating wandering around the kitchen doing other things because I felt um I could didn't have the time but you do have the time and once you start sitting down to eat you realize um that you feel a lot better just to take that time um and treat yourself occasionally do something nice that you um, really enjoy and don't feel bad about it enjoy it and the other thing is to try and adopt a sleep good sleep pattern which isn't always easy I mean when my son was really ill he didn't sleep at night so it was very difficult for me to sleep but I managed to take a few naps during the day um, and take just short breaks from your daily routine just now and then that's that's kind of how I see it um, what about you Lewis but there, there is just one bit I wanted to add because and, and I guess this is more from my mindfulness around kind of reflection again kind of reflection is a strange word isn't it sometimes how it's used and and when we ask someone to reflect not too long well this was a couple of months ago and they said well every time i've sat back and reflect i've just got really tearful really upset that mm -hmm. the cared for person is kind of not going to get better and they're not going to move forward and it actually kind of withdrew us in to kind of talking okay well what steps can we do in terms of okay there, there is not going to be um this great recovery that everybody expects and then and things returning back to normal but there is an essence of what can we do to improve the quality of life for that person while mm -hmm. while they're while they're unwell or uh, while you're within this caring role and that added as a great a greater reflection tool for for that individual because she wouldn't reflect on on all the things that were going wrong and how it was but would reflect more on how can i make the best for this person in the situation that they're in and that was really good for that person to be able to move forward and feel valued and empowered so the first steps to access and support for you or the person you care for is for your GP step to wellbeing or, or connections. And there will be uh, information attached to this that will provide all of that information with contact details. And there are lots of local resources um, that are available. Um, we have put some of them up um, on here for you, but there will also be another attachment attached to this that um, will give you further information. And I don't know how many of you have heard about the triangle of care. 
it's something that Dorset has been doing for, oh gosh, a few years now. First of all, um, a group of um, us were going into um, the acute hospitals, the psychiatric hospitals, to talk to um, people on the wards and explain to them about the triangle of care. And it was the triangle of care was brought about by um, a carer and um, he felt that when he went into hospitals or was involved that he, as a carer he wasn't involved with anything the psychiatrist or the uh, mental health team would talk to the person who was unwell and they were meant to talk to the person who was supporting them but that didn't always happen and um, it, he decided that it was probably a good thing to have a triangle which um, you would have the supporter and the member of staff and the patient or the person who was unwell um, in this triangle so that you all talk together and you all work together. And there were six principles um, to this um, and it was to be carers to be recognised as essential role they play in um, taking care of a person and supporting them. The staff to be carer aware and trained in carer engage engagement strategies um, and policies and practices um, of, about confidentiality and sharing information are in place because I don't know about uh, many of you as carers, but I know at the very beginning when I tried to find out about my son who was in a psychiatric on a psychiatric ward. Um, and I wanted to know I was just told they couldn't tell me anything because it was confidential and I was just it was just like a brick wall you couldn't find anything out and um, it was very frustrating um, and the, the other one is um, defined posts so that carers know who on the ward is, is who does what and who they are um, and an introduction to all the services and the staff available um, and things to, that can signpost you to other information um, when somebody's in hospital um, certainly in the uh, west and north of Dorset um, the people to give you extra support and carer support is rethink and you need to be told that and if, you, if you're in the east it's um, it's crisp and the carers offices who are attached to the CMHTs it's things like that that you actually need to know to be able to do the job you're expected to do when you're supporting someone and um, it's it's knowing all that sort of thing. Um, we've been going to um, all the CMHTs and talking to them about what it's like to be a carer, how it feels and um, how important it is to actually involve us in things. Because if you think about it, when somebody actually comes out of hospital, they're put into the care of the family. And there's one person there who's known as the carer or the supporter, but they're the person that's um, taking that responsibility on. If you have no information, it's yeah. an extremely difficult job because you don't have training. So at least we know. And and, and if you get to know about what um, the triangle of care is about, then um, you'll be able to say to somebody, well, look, what about the triangle of care? You've got your star for this. So please, can you include us and explain it to us and, and tell us what's going on? Um, um, well, that, that's the triangle of care and it should be there working for you and you're entitled to ask. I do think it's made a difference all the training with staff as well because I think carers are much more at the forefront of their minds now because um, I know I'm asked very early on when someone is just coming into services you know could I could I contact the carers um, it might be you know it's likely to be appropriate for a carers assessment so I think in sort of imprinting that on the staff has, has been really really important as well as, as this is an expectation of, of the support that we offer and how that we're, we're behaved so I think it's definitely made a difference. Yeah I, I, I firmly believe that the triangle of care is, is the gold standard across the yeah. board it, it empowers carers it, it means that carers are able to, to confidently challenge the CMHTs or healthcare professionals with an understanding of what their rights are as a carer mm -hmm. it allows organizations like ourselves to ensure that the CMHTs and the hospitals have adopted the triangle of care and it's something we can reflect back on with all of the CMHTs and hospitals at that moment. Um, we, we get a lot of feedback once we, we do some triangle of care training with carers that go, well, actually, 
I haven't been listened to for, for years and I've gone in and I've mentioned the triangle of care and I've been shown a seat and I've been allowed to talk and I've been allowed to be part of the conversation or the meetings. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of secretly hoping that this, this pandemic is going to be a revolution for carers in a way that actually carers know their value now. They know actually mm -hmm. without all the services at their beck and call they are able to to manage the situation they're able to adopt uh, a different outputs to ensure that they can manage and i'm not saying this is something that wants to be adopted forever but it certainly mm -hmm. said you know it, it's that reflection again of when when the cmhts are saying well actually you're not allowed this information it's kind of saying well actually i've been the main source of this caring role for the last three months when times are really mm -hmm. difficult and actually no one was there for me over this three months or, or the contact was limited and I'm kind of hoping it now for the CMHTs to reflect about the value that carers provide for that role for the cared for person how it's crucial that actually if we take the carers out of the situation right now we would be in a complete mental health pandemic and we're not and that's because of the carers that are supporting people in in difficult situations and I think it's a great time for everyone to look at this is a, a reflective moment to say well actually we really need to show appreciation for for the carers that are out there providing this support mm -hmm. and for the carers to also recognize that they provide so much support so much valuable support because we really would be in a different crisis right now if it wasn't for carers okay so um so just to remind anyone that's watching that we are here for you um and and it is really important that you look after your own well-being um, and, and, you know, to take the um, advantage to talk to someone um, and please make contact with the services that are listed in the attachment, such as Steps to Wellbeing and the resources that Rethink offer and the Mental Health Forum, because they've all been put in place um, to support you during this difficult time.